Hey everybody, this is Rod Morgenstein and I'm on Musicians on the Record today, so hit it. On the record, bring it on. Can you talk about your process, the that sort of prep process for you, either back then or now, when you're getting ready to perform live? And and I'm also really curious when you were cutting the albums in the studio, uh, around what your process was there and creating music. Yeah, well, um, I you know the. For me, the best part of my career has been um, existing in different musical realms. Mm. You know, starting with the Dixie Dregs, that was the instrumental musician mm. kind of music, touching on a lot of different mm. elements. And then uh, when the winger thing happened, all of a sudden, uh, you know, I found myself in a band that's touring the world with like, the Scorpions, yes. you know, Bon Jovi, yes. Poison, Cinderella. And, um, you know, the reason that different styles of music sound the way they do are because of different elements that go into the music. And so if you're just going to play the same way that you played in your fusion band, in whatever it is you do, it's not going to come off with any authenticity. Yes. And so, so the starting point for me is that whether, whether it's Dixie Dregs or Winger or Jazz is Dead, which is more of a jam band thing, yeah. or Rudis Morgenstein Project, which is total over the top, mm -hmm. or the Jelly Jam, uh, yeah. which is this power trio that I have with Dream Theater's bassist John Mayung and Ty Tabor, the guitarist from King's X. Wow. That's, that's a whole other kind of yeah. vocal, vocal oriented musicians, rock music. Um, the approach is a little bit different mm -hmm. each of those mm. styles. And, you know, I kind of um, pride myself in, in trying to uh, make an attempt to sound authentic mm -hmm. in those styles while also bringing in certain elements of who I am yes as a player and yep. um, I, you know so so in preparing to do a recording mm -hmm. with any one of those bands kind of have to think about you know um, the big picture how do we want the drums to come off mm -hmm. how we're going to approach playing all of these songs and with some you hit a little bit harder with others yeah. you let off a little bit yeah. um, uh with some, you have to um, kind of tuck the ghost strokes away. Okay, yeah, yeah, not, right. There's, I have a story that, relating to everything, you know. Um, sure, great. Um, all right, so, and I think this is true with many drummers. Mm -hmm. We never kind of take a moment to listen to the way we play mm. see what are what are our norms and mm. things that we don't even think about mm. um, and if we don't do that there might be times where uh oh it's too late to undo yes the way that I play so for example um, a lot of rock drummers bury the beater into the bass drum head mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. right yes and there's nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. um, but that drummer might find themselves in a in a recording situation where an engineer or producer says to the drummer bass drum sounds choked mm. like why isn't it do why is it yeah. breathing what's going on yeah and then the drummer will either not be aware or um mm. the engineer or producer or someone will come out watch the drummer play and go oh look at that you're not letting up on the beater after you hit the bass drum can yeah. you just let up on it yeah and 
The reality is, no. Right. Undo the way you play right. on the spot. Right. Very, very difficult, okay? Yes. And so, so for that reason, I think it's a really good idea at some point for a drummer to video mm. them yes. playing so they can just look at their four limbs and see what tendencies they have. Yeah. Right. So when, when Winger recorded its third album, Pull, mm -hmm. in 19... It's like around... We started the latter part of 1992. Mm -hmm. We were so excited because uh, we were getting to work with Mike Shipley, who was this incredible engineer who had worked with Mutt Lang yeah, sure. for a decade. Sure. All of the big Def Leppard records yeah. and whatever else, Mutt Lang, who was probably... ACDC. Uh, yeah, he started with, right, Back in Black. Yeah, right. <laughs> one of the most successful producers of all time in terms of record sales, for sure. Yes, yes. And so, so we hired Mike Shipley mm. to engineer and co-produce mm. this third winger record. Mm. And um, before I flew to California... Mike called me up and said, Rod, I just want to have a conversation with you before you come out here um, to make sure that you understand, you know, uh, we're trying to make a really cool rock record. And I said, yeah, Mike, absolutely. And I'm so excited to work with you. And uh, he said, well, you know, without naming names, I just worked with, you know, a very, very well-known fusion drummer, mm -hmm. your contemporaries. And uh, we kind of battled in the studio because I was asking him to do certain things and he refused to do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, um, I'm, I'm all ears. I'm always open-minded. Uh, yeah. I don't, you know, think about, I don't think of myself as someone who thinks he knows everything by any stretch of the imagination. And, yeah. oh my God, your track record is amazing. He said, good, great. So, um, he said, uh, one of the things, just have it in your mind, no ghost strokes, okay? okay. I said, yeah, no, no problem. Okay. All right. So a couple weeks later, there I am in this studio, mm -hmm. and the first song we're about to record is the opening track to the album mm -hmm. called Mind Revolution, and it's just like this medium slow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. He said, ready? I said, I am ready. He said, okay, remember, no ghost strokes. I said, yeah, no problem. So about 10 seconds into the song, he stops the recording and he says, what about the ghost strokes? I said, I didn't play one. And he said, okay, why don't you come in the control room and listen to all the ghost strokes that you didn't play? <laughs> okay. Okay, so there they were. You know, like, yeah, the yeah. speakers don't lie. So right, right. I thought I was going do, ba, do, do, ba, but in reality, what was coming out was do, ba, do, 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 ba, ba. Yeah. All <laughs> so, um, I was mortified, mm. and so here I was in uh, 1992. 17 years out of college, yeah. yeah, never thinking about the fact that I always play ghost strokes <laughs> and in a recording situation, which is a pressure situation because all eyes are on the drummer. Mm -hmm. We were cutting drum tracks. Nobody else was recording. I see. And are you, are you coming up with those in the moment, Rod? Are, are those pre-written? Are you writing those drum tracks? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, okay. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, but um, to his credit, you know, uh, a lot of the music that Winger um, does uh, for, starts with a demo. Mm -hmm. And Kip used to be into doing some sophisticated drum programming. Mm -hmm. in, in recent years, he'll just put a one measure umpa, umpa beat in. Okay. Mm -hmm. But so there, there was occasion in those early days where I really loved... Uh, some of the things that he did, and so I just yeah. kept stuck with it. But so, so the only way I was able to get through that song and, and the other songs was mm. every time I hit the snare, I had to raise my arm right. and make sure I wasn't 
hitting the overhead mics. Got it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just bam, yes. bam, it was bam, arm up, right. bam, arm up. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very self-conscious feeling. Sure. Where you're having to not only think about the song that you're playing and the drum parts that you want to play, but like, all right, keep the hand out of the way, keep the hand out of the way. And so I'll just reiterate, every drummer out there, take a moment at some point to video yourself so you can watch what you're doing um, just so you're aware of whether you play ghost strokes and aren't aware of it or bury the beater into the bass drum head. Or one other thing was um, years before Winger, uh, on the second Dixie Dregs record, which was the first time we were working with Ken Scott, mm -hmm. producer, um, we were recording a song called Ice Cakes. Okay. And Ken Scott stopped the recording and he said, guys, take a few minutes. I have to find this weird alien sound that I'm hearing on, the, on one of the drum mics. Uh -oh. And one by one, he would solo each mic. Um, and lo and behold, it was determined that I make alien sounds when I play. Wow. <laughs> That's part of the jazz fusion. Who knows? Well, <laughs> you know, um, I think many musicians uh, help themselves to keep time or to feel things by maybe clicking their teeth yes. together. So I, ah. I apparently make alien sounds like. <laughs> 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 so, so when that was figured out, obviously, you know, all hell broke loose. Everybody was in hysterics. <laughs> And um, from that point on, they literally duct taped my mouth shut. <laughs> I was going to say, how do you stop that? That's that's <laughs> harder than going back to basics. But for that one song, for Ice Cakes, yeah. Ken, who thought it was so funny, he put a vocal mic on me and he said, Rod, just play how you play. Don't think about it. I want to do a track of your grunting. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to quietly mix it in. That's great. Yeah. You know, in the breakdown sections of the song. And if you listen to it, you will hear it. That's like a <laughs> Bonham squeaky bass on Since I've Been Loving You, is the bass drum pedal there. Yeah. And so, certainly that's something that works, the live performance on tour. That's a great example, something not working so well in the studio, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, um, live performance is much more forgiving than the studio. Yeah. Because unless you're recording a live show, right. the moment the moment is here for a second, right. and it's history. It's gone. Yeah. And um, and even in live recordings, um, you have the audience, and then there's a lot of ambient sound. And so yes. So these things that I'm talking about are are not nearly as big considerations as when you're in a controlled studio environment. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you rolled pretty well with that. It was it was. You know, because I, I think about when I'm hearing other musicians talking about making mistakes um, and some of the struggles around that, whether live performance or in the studio, Rod, can you talk about how do you just deal with making mistakes and going from there? Well, technology has changed everything. Yeah. Back, back in the old days, you didn't even work with click track, you know, um, First, the first commercially released Dixie Dregs record was recorded in 1976, and it wasn't until our fifth album mm. that we even used a click track, and that even then it was only on one song, I think. Wow. Mm. Um, and that was because um, that was the first time the band wasn't recording together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, you know, after click tracks, came in, um, we then eventually got to the point of the advent of digital recording. Mm -hmm. And once that started, it was the first time that the drums didn't have to play a song from start to finish. Yeah. Now, with, with analog recording, everybody else could still do a few measures at a time. Yeah. 
and then punch in. Mm-hmm. So a bass, bass player could go, you know, do 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 do. Oh, could you take it from there? Yeah. So they they're listening, and then they punch. Do 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 do. Oh, take it from there. Yeah. So there there could be a hundred edits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The yeah. other instruments' performances. Yes. Just get one nice, clean, good feeling, sounding, in time take. Yeah. Drums have the problem of cymbal. Mm. Uh, you know, decay, and so you can't hit a cymbal, and while it's the sound is decaying, with an analog recording setup, you can't press record because it'll go. Yeah. It'll go. Right. <laughs> yeah. But with digital recording, you know the good engineers, they're able to smooth that over, and so now drummers have the luxury of playing a few bars, saying, "All right, let's take it." From eight seconds in, yeah, and um, and then on top of that, when you listen back to your performance, you can listen to a drum fill and say, you know that Tom hit there, I didn't mean to hit it so soon, right? Make it a little lazy, mm-hmm. and then boom, yeah. yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, and so there's no telling uh, in the recordings of today how much of what we're hearing. Right. Uh, was actually performed exactly like that by the drummer or not, or any of the instruments. And in fact, there are probably recordings where the entire drum track, you know, is um, highlighted and then quantized mm-hmm. to 60, 70, 80, 90, 100% wow. perfect. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it gets into a discussion. I mean, people will argue this. Um, into infinity right is that cheating is it not cheating mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what is uh you know what is the bottom line to me you know you want these recordings to live on right to eternity so that generations after you're long gone maybe discover your playing and go wow absolutely something else and so you know, technology has an upside, I guess, and a downside. But mm-hmm. if technology can can correct some of the imperfections of your playing that you wish weren't there, right? Well, I'm all for it. That's yeah. that's me. Some okay. We'll have another perspective, but right. you know, there are a, col- a couple of cringe moments. Mm-hmm. The analog recordings that I've done, like, oh my God, you right. how the time drags dramatically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We yeah. come out of the slide guitar solo in Twigs Approved mm-hmm. on this record. But okay, here's a really funny yeah. story. Yeah. Great, excellent. There's a Dixie Dregs call, song called uh, I'm Freaking Out. Okay. And one of the sections in the song is very funky and syncopated. Mm-hmm. The whole song is in 4-4 four, four time. Oh, OK. Yeah. I mean, th- there's a lot of you know, interesting syncopations, very challenging. But at the end of the day, it's all in 4-4. Four, four. Yeah. So um, you know, a year or so after that album was out, the D- Dixie Dreads, we were on tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, a musician comes up to me after the concert and said, man, I love the way you drop an eighth note you know, in the in that the syncopated that that funky section, hmm. I was thinking like, I said yeah, you know, like it's a it's a measure of seven eight, mm. which is one eighth note less than four four. Yeah. And so I looked at him, and I realized, oh my God, I must have rushed. Right. Mm. Right. Didn't mean to. <laughs> when I went back and listened to it, I rushed. Now, now the thing is. You know, the beauty of even analog recording is um, when the guys in the band went back to start putting down bass mm. and guitar and keyboards and violin, when they heard that rushed drum note, the bass player, Andy, just said, I'll just match your note. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? so, yeah. so it goes by and everybody's playing with the drummer who rushed. Got it. So, so it can sound like yeah. a Odd time measure. Right. <laughs> I meant that, right? <laughs> I, meant, exactly, I meant that. That's right. I really, I really did. Right, exactly. Yeah. But, but this was this was pre click track days. Right. 
Right. You know, I, I have the vision of certainly when you're talking about late 70s, early 80s, and then, you know, late 80s, early 90s with Winger, a lot of festivals uh, you must have played. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, like, who you ended up playing with and were there ever folks that you went, wow, I'm getting to play with or at least stand on the stage and watch these guys? You know, it's funny. Um you know, Winger being uh, my band that sold by far the most records of anything I've ever just, yeah. that's my platinum selling band, you know? Yeah. yeah. The largest crowd I ever played for was not with Winger, it was with the Dixie Dregs. Is that right? In Atlanta, Georgia, at the Georgia Tech football stadium. I think it was around 50,000 people. Wow. Um, there was a band from Atlanta called the Atlanta Rhythm Section. Oh, sure. Classic, right? Yeah. And they were huge. Yeah. Certainly down south. They had a yeah. lot of, you know, top ten songs. Yes. And um, one of their big songs was called Champagne Jam. We're going to have us the Champagne Jam. And so every year would be this com concert in Atlanta. Yeah. And at least the year that we played with them was the Champagne Jam. That's great. The football stadium. And... Uh, they were the headliner, and below them were Aerosmith, the mm -hmm. Cars. Mm. The Cars were out on tour for their first album. Uh -huh. So that was in the early early years of new, new age, not new age. Uh, what, what was their music called? Um, yeah, new wave, I think, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And another, another big band from yeah. Atlanta and the South, um, uh, Mother's Finest. Oh, well, I haven't heard of them. Yeah. So. Um, so that, that was 50,000 and wow. you know, I've never, never played in front of that many people. And it's an awesome sight yeah. to take in, to just like everywhere you look yes. are these dots. But you know, the nearest, the nearest human being is, yeah. at least from where you are on stage behind your drum set, yes. they can be 40 feet away from you. Wow. So, so there's not anything remotely close to an intimate. Right rapport with your audience right but it's a different kind of thing and uh and it's an incredible rush yeah it must be must be but you know there's something really special about playing a club where mm. you have you know a hundred to a thousand people right. Right. and uh the audience is is just right their heads are right yeah off the front of the stage sure um winger's done a lot of you know, festivals with 20,000 people, 30,000 mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and we played with um, ZZ Top, yeah. Brian Adams, yeah. um, a couple of months with Kiss. Ah, great. That must three, have been fun. <laughs> three months with the Scorpions, some shows with Bon Jovi upstate New York in, uh, in like a softball, no, or minor league baseball stadium. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, that, they're it's all they're all a little bit different in terms of a football stadium, um, a an arena like a Madison Square Garden, mm. um, a theater, and a club. You know, those are really the four different kinds of venues. Um, and if if the band's monitoring system on stage is not functioning properly, yeah. it's not fun not fun at all right because you can't hear right right if, if you're looking at the guys and you don't hear them yeah um yes it's, it's it can be very troubling but you have to smile for the audience because it's the one day that they're right seeing you yeah. and you do your best to power through it when, when you're playing a stadium like that fifty thousand people twenty thousand thirty thousand people um, any nerves uh, you get nervous at all around that or did you used to and if so how do you deal with that? Now, you don't get any more or less nervous okay. for me, the size, the size of the place. Um, I always have a little bit of, you know, the, the, the um, what do you call it, you know, the tingles in the stomach. Sure, sure. Uh, until I start playing and I'm about a minute into the first song. Then everything kinds to, be, tends to settle down. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, when you've done this kind of thing in the thousands of mm, times, right? You know, you have it down kind of to a science. You bet. But there is, there are the teeniest bit of jitters until it gets going. The 
the situations that always are nerve wracking are when you're doing television. Ah, okay. And uh, you typically get one shot. So like, right. you know, when you're like on the Jay Leno show and and all of a sudden you see the red lights, like, yeah. quasi, or, you know, and yeah. then Jay, Jay goes, please welcome. Right. The Dick and Dregs. It's like, here yes. we go. Right. Uh, I hold on to the sticks tighter, mm -hmm. comfortable. Yeah. But the last thing you need is to drop a stick right. when you're getting your one shot yes. in a live television audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You talked about how music has changed over the years from analog to digital. Can you also talk a little bit about how the music business has changed from when you started to now? It, the music business has changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, there used to be a template mm -hmm. that was followed where if a band or an artist wanted to get a record deal, mm -hmm. You would do a three or four song demo mm -hmm. and package it, you know, with a photograph and maybe a little bio yep. and then have it shopped to record labels, mm -hmm. either through a music attorney or some other method. Okay. Um, and that seemed to be the way uh, that everybody did it until say 20 years ago when everything started to change um, and uh, um, you know technology mm -hmm. began to wreak havoc yeah. uh, with so many aspects mm -hmm. of the music business to where record labels began I, it's like they felt they were losing control mm -hmm. because everything was showing up on the internet the music started being shared mm -hmm for free right Napster yep mm -hmm. and so record sales have plummeted mm -hmm. through the years and so record labels don't have the same kind of money to throw around right. that they used to mm -hmm. and so I think they're you know big labels they're less apt to sign something mm -hmm. unless it seems like a relative relatively sure thing yeah but you know for for the young person who who's embracing technology and really understands the way it's all working, mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a lot of power at their fingertips in terms of being able to, to do by themselves the things that used to take spending a hundred or 200,000 to hire a video company to make a video right. and a hundred or 200,000 dollars to hire a producer and go in a recording studio right. and, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. What, do whatever to get the video played on MTV and the, the, right. you know now yeah. with YouTube right. uh, you know with a laptop and, and a little bit of software mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the ability to make almost album sounding quality recordings mm. and then you know for no money uh, with a little bit of creative side mm -hmm. uh, you, you can make a video that used to cost in the hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. and then get it up on YouTube. Now, how you make things go viral, again, you know, this is not my generation. I, right. I know from none of these <laughs> things. Yeah. I, yeah. I have students coming in to my class at Berkeley mm -hmm. and say, hey, can I, can I play you, you know, the original music my band's working on and or you know, this one has a video, and like I can even bring it up on YouTube, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, here's an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kid. Right. And I'm watching a video yeah. at Atlantic Records used to mm. you know, sell out a small fortune. That's right. Uh, where now, you know, with your iPhone, you can yeah. do any number of things right. with incredible effects and uh, showcase your band to the world yes. now so that's an unbelievable thing i guess you could say okay so but the other side to that is well if everybody could do it now instead of there being a thousand bands there's going to be a million bands right so right so competition is yes different. it goes way up right yeah it goes way up but you know the thing i always like to point out is every generation wants its stars, okay? Like, mm -hmm. 
a kid who's 18 years old, they're not interested in Rod and his project. And sure. Are you kidding? He's older than my grandparents, kind of thing. Like, I want my bands. And, um, and so the bottom line is every year there has to be a new crop of young bands and artists, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to to join the music scene. And so there will always be careers to be had mm. for new faces. Yeah. How many, I don't know, right. um, but it can't just end to where there'll no longer be a career or a living to be made uh, by young musicians who are, who are coming up. It's not to say it's easy, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say it was easy 40 years ago. Right when I was trying to do it, it's always going to be a challenge yes. um, when you're trying to make your mark in a creative field. Mm -hmm. You will have naysayer after naysayer telling you, you don't have a chance in hell. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe the odds are tough, mm -hmm. but we were hearing it. Right. Well, like, you're never gonna make it, you don't have a chance. What are you kidding? You don't yeah. have a singer. Right. You can't dance to your music, blah, blah, blah. And um, here I am, four decades later, in my fifth decade wow. later, yeah. and uh, I'm still having a blast, you know? I'm still recording, still touring. It's amazing. Um, I've made, you know, I've kind of added the education side of music to my portfolio, to where, you know, I've been involved with Berkeley College of Music um, I yesterday completed my 19th year. Mm, wow, congratulations, that's fantastic. Making the commute, you know, 240 miles each yeah. way. Yeah.